I will implement programs that will cater to the youth, save the state from self-centered politicians, and of course, build a better Lagos. This is the word, or these are the words, I beg your pardon, of Fungsha Doherty, governorship candidate of the African Democratic Congress in Lagos. Tonight, we discuss his plans for Lagos State and preparations for 2023 elections. This is Post Politics. I am Mary Ann. The gubernatorial candidate of the African Democratic Congress ADC in Lagos State, Funsho Dohati, has promised to implement programs that will cater for the youth and save the state from self-centered political class. He made the promise during the unveiling of the former Lagos magistrate, Rosemary Giwa Amo, as his running mate for the 2023 governorship election. He described Giwa Amo's emergence as a clear preference for integrity, equity and justice in leadership and governance. And joining us tonight is Funshoto Hati. He is the governorship candidate of the ADC in Lagos. It's good to have you join us in the studio. Thank you. Thank you. How's your name pronounced? Doherty or Dohati? Well, in Lagos, we actually pronounce it Doherty. Doherty. Okay, I learned something new. <laughs> Uh, let's cut through the chase. I'm sure that um, many people have interviewed you and asked you several questions like this. Why do you want to be governor of Lagos? Well, uh, I, like many others, um, recognize that Lagos is operating far below its potential. Um, many of us grew up in a Lagos um, that we remember fondly, um, a Lagos that in many ways um, you know, it rep represents something that we, we actually need to aspire to get back to and then move beyond. Um, it is clear that we have suffered from a failure of leadership in Lagos State. It's very clear. Um, and this is not evidence from Funshaw Duarte. It is um, evidence that we see from um, independent assessors of cities like Lagos. So recently there was a... Um, there was an economist intelligence unit report that comes out uh, annually that ranks cities in terms of their development um, on a global scale. And they ranked 172 cities. And Lagos was ranked 171 out of 172. Last but one. And what does it measure? It measures cities and ranks them by those factors that affect the um, standards and quality of life of the citizens. So, infrastructure, health, education, culture and environment, and stability. And when they measured all of these things and then presented a report card for Lagos, Lagos came 171 out of 172. This is after 25 years of being ruled by one, essentially one ruling party. So, if you rule a state for 25 years, um, and you get a report card at the end of 25 years saying that out of the 172 cities across the world that we looked at, you came 171. I think it's a clear testament to the failure of leadership. And you think that you can bring that turnaround that the, in quote, one party has not been able to? Yes. How do you intend to do this? So absolutely. And if you look at it at the root of this difference between where we are and where we ought to be, is the fact that the leadership of Lagos has generally not acted in the interest of the uh, average citizen. How so? We what we have seen is more of a self-serving government, a government that has made Lagos work for a few rather than for the many. Uh, it's a government that has increased inequality, right, as opposed to a government that should be in reducing inequalities and, and ensuring that nobody gets left behind. We have seen an increasing um, situation in which the needs of the leaders and those that are close to the leaders are put paramount. Uh, and we see that even in terms of the resources that the leaders of the state have historically accumulated for themselves. And I think this is, I'm not saying anything that anybody does not know in Lagos. Uh, and I think it is evident that for that to change, people like us, and it's not just me, it's others also who feel 
they have something to contribute, who have a background of a track record uh, of leading with integrity, mm -hmm. who feel they have the character and the competence, step up to the plate and say, you know what? Um, it's time to contest for the public office because it is the occupant of the public office that must address the needs of the people. We need people in those seats who understand that those seats are a sacred trust for the benefit of the people. And it's not something to be utilized for a narrow interest, not something to be utilized for yourself or people that are close to you. It is something that is vested in you for the benefit of the people. We need people who have the character of leadership because leadership has a character. Mm. A lot of politicians wax very lyrical when they want to run for office, when they're trying to get our votes. They mm -hmm. tell us all the right things. In fact, I realize that manifestos are not even written by these politicians. People are paid to write these manifestos, so it sounds all fine and dandy. But then when you sit on that seat, things begin to change. So why should Lagosians trust you? What's the background and what's the um, your antecedents, what have you done that people can hold on to and say, well, we can put our trust, even it be, even it be that of a mustard seed in you to give you this opportunity to vote, uh, or rather to run for this office? It's a good question. I come to this with 30 years uh, of experience in the private sector. I have led organizations. I have led three companies as managing director and CEO, two of which were uh, national companies employing uh, hundreds of employees nationally. Um, managing assets in the hundreds of billions. So I have a rich uh, record that people can go to. And those companies are still there. They are still running. So people can go and, and essentially verify. So I have a verifiable record of leading in integrity, with integrity um, and occupying positions of power. You know, they say that if you want to test a man's character, do not give him adversity, give him power. Mm. A lot of the time what happens is when people occupy positions uh, that, they are, that they don't have a lifelong preparation for. You, we see that unravel when they occupy those seats. Uh, uh, this is not, leadership is something that's been a lifelong experience for me. And I think that I'm very clear uh, as to why I'm seeking public office. Uh, I had a very successful career in private sector, which I left to come and do this. Uh, because as a Lagosian, I think that Lagos, having had a generation of leadership under one entity, uh, could have been so much more. And I think that Lagos can actually go from third world status to first world status in the span of a generation, mm -hmm. given the things that we are endowed with. If we have the right leadership and the commitment to make it happen, I think it can happen. You're one man, and I, I mean, of course, I'm here to bring out all the answers from you. You're one person. Yep. Uh, as much as you say to us today that you have had great background, a great background in the private sector, it's totally different, a different ball game when you come to the public sector. Um, I mean, managing a business is all great, but then managing a state is a big deal. Uh, and Let's take, for example, President Buhari came and he said, oh, he had the best interest at heart. He wanted to change Nigeria. Can we really say that any change has happened between then and now, knowing that he's one person and you're one man? How do you intend to break the establishment if you're able to? How do you think that you can change those things in hopefully four, four or eight years? So I, I think that, um, first of all, the idea that the public sector is this whole very different place from the private sector in terms of leadership, I think is overblown. Right? And I think that that is part of the problem. I think that if you come to the public sector thinking that you know, things cannot be done right in the public sector or there's a way they do things in the public sector, you will get that outcome. Right? A lot depends on what you as a leader bring to, to and it's not different from coming to an organization. Right? Um, you set a tone and the tone that is set at the top has a way of permeating through the organization. Um, I, I think Leaders need to come into public office with that mindset, um, not with the idea that we will conform to the way things are done in the public sector, but that we will bring the best of leadership uh, attributes, the best of, um, of, of expectations in terms of integrity, 
in terms of the way in which people fulfill their responsibilities, in, in, in terms of the way in which people are held to account. All of those things which we know to work, where you have organizations of people, you create the right incentives, you create the right rewards, you create consequences for wrong behavior, and you insist and you insist and you push those changes through. Mm. And government, as you've noted, is not a one-man show. And obviously, we're not run, going to run a one-man show. We're coming in with a government, right? Um, and there's a cabinet. But it's very important who is at the top because the person at the top not only sets the tone, but also determines the kind of people that they surround themselves with, right? And if your objective is to do a good job and to do a good job for the citizens, that is what you will solve for. So you will look for people to surround you, to work with you, to assist you to deliver that mandate, who are of a like mind, right? Because that is what you are solving for. If, on the other hand, you are solving for something else, if you are coming there to feather your nest or to, um, or to further the interests of the people who facilitated your coming to power, then the people you surround yourself will reflect that objective. You may want people around you who are very loyal to you, who will not talk back to you. Mm -hmm. So, so um, leadership tenets right, are ingrained. They are learned. Some are intrinsic. But if you bring them to an organization, whether it's a private sector organization or a public sector organization, you can get the right results. And I think that that is what is lacking. It's not the case that we've lacked intelligent people in government. Mm. It's not the case that we've lacked intelligent people in government. We have Nigerians. Nigerians are very smart. Even those who have negative intentions are yeah. also smart. But uh, well, how, how do we end up having the worst of us? I'm using the word loosely here. Mm -hmm. Leading the best of us. Because you're, you, just, you just alluded to the fact that we have very intelligent people. How come that we do not have those very intelligent people come to bear when it comes to leadership in the public sector? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, the, the, the failure of leadership is not only a lack of intelligence. It's also a lack of um, um, the will to do the right thing. So you may be intelligent, but you may not have the will to do the right thing. You may be intelligent in the wrong direction. There's positive entrepreneurship. There's negative entrepreneurship. So it's a, it's a part of it's about the intention, right? Um, but I think your question is a larger one, and there are other dimensions to it. So, um, and it's a, part of, it's a part of the reason why we are where we are, which is that the political process um, historically in Nigeria has not been friendly to people who may want to come with that agenda of positive change. Um, and if you look at it historically, you will see, for example, that uh, there's been a preponderance of um, candidates who have won office coming from two of the political parties. And the process of emerging through those parties often is such that by the time those candidates emerge, that process, a lot of the time, has involved certain compromises and has robbed them of the agency to, make a, to bring a change agenda by the time they get there. Um, often we see godfatherism in some of these parties. Um, and you will see the case where even the sitting governor right, is not a principal, is an agent in the sense that you know, someone put him there and he, he kowtows to, um, to that person. And we've seen it. Um, one of the things that was very clear to me uh, when we came into this race was that we're not going to pursue this agenda on the platform of either of those two you know, preponderant parties. Because we felt that we wanted to come through um, contest for the office, make our appeal to the people of, of Lagos, win their, their votes and their trust, and get there not compromised with a free hand to bring what is needed to improve the lives of the people. I, I really wanted to leave this for later, but since you brought it up, let's go there. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm sure that I'm not the first. I would ask you why the ADC, but you've given us a reason that mm -hmm. you didn't want to, you know, go to... 
But then what's the structure of the ADC in Lagos? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because some people, I've spoken to people who said, oh, it's a three-horse race. Some say it's a two-horse race. Um, but then it's these parties and the others for when these conversations are being had. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the chances that the ADC could even rise to be part of the horse race in the first instance? We don't have to rise to be part of it. We're already we're part of the horse race already. But but but, um, so let's interrogate that. Um, many will look at Lagos, and let's talk about Lagos specifically because yeah. I'm on the agenda of Lagos. Many will look at Lagos and say Lagos is an APC state. It's been ruled by APC or its antecedent entities for 25 years. What is going to make that change? Right? which is a, a shade of the question that you're asking. What we say is that you have to question this narrative of dominance. Why do I say that? The present governor of Lagos, Jide Sonwolu, was elected with 700,000 votes. That's, that's all. Lagos, as of 2019, had 6.5 million voters. So for every one person who showed up in the polling, in total, by the way, there were only a million votes. He got 700. All the others got 200. Now, what that tells you is that for every one person that showed up, five people stayed away. Mm -hmm. One to five. So it tells you that it's a narrow minority, actually, that elected the so-called ruling party. And that what has happened is more a case of people staying away, being apathetic, voting with their feet away from the process because they do not believe in the process, etc. Yet those who showed up voted for the ruling party. Many of those who showed up voted for the ruling party for a number of reasons, which we can delve into. But... Um, but but if you look at it critically and you consider 2023 in relation to 2019, one of the things that you see is that there is much greater voter engagement in 2023. We see a lot more fervor, a lot more interest by voters in, getting, in being a part of the process, getting registered, etc. I'm sure you see it. I have seen it. Mm. Uh, people lining up, coming back days and days to get their voters' cards. Um, people are resolute that they're going, to, they're going to be involved in this process. There are a number of reasons for that. But remember, a number of things have happened between 2019 and today. We've had answers. We've had Soros OK. I mean, people are really at their wits end. People are fed up. Mm. Rich are fed up. Poor are fed up. Middle class are fed up. Mm. Old are fed up, young are fed up, middle-aged are fed up. But so how does people, the ADC buy into that? So people want to participate. Now, um, most of the folks who are coming out to register, to line up, because they are dissatisfied with the status quo, are not coming and lining up for two days to get their PVC, only to come and vote for the ruling party. That is our contention. Our contention is that 2023 is going to be very different. 2023 is going to be very different. And so if you come to 2023, 2023 thinking that, you know, there is a, an immutable, um, unchangeable um, way in which uh, elections happen in Lagos State, I think people will be very surprised. But you see, again... Just as you say, I have spoken, spoken to a few governorship candidates and they're also all banking on the fact that, oh, well, everybody's happy now. Everybody wants to vote. Everybody wants to participate. But then you have to be able to map your crowd. So what are you doing to buy a big chunk? And I'm using the word buy loosely because, I uh, mean, you how do you get... You <laughs> exactly. How do you get the attention of those people? Because we have the SDP, we have the Labour Party, we have the PDP, we have the APC, and then there's you. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you have to look at, as much as you, you see people open to new ideas and mm -hmm. new political parties, mm -hmm. it's not just you who's are, you know, out there. No, and it should not be. It should be a contest, right? Exactly. And, and that's part of what we're doing. We're having the conversation today. 
right? People are assessing me as they are listening to me, right? And people are very, very clear that in 2023, they're not about voting about parties only. They're very interested in who the candidates are. They want to look at the candidates, they want to hear them, they want to look into their eyes, and they want to make the judgment as to who do they think is going to act in their interest. It's not about coming and spewing manifestos. We've heard that before. Who do they believe has the character? Who do they believe has the track record? Who do they believe has the sincerity to act in their interest? Mm. So, so this is the case that we're making. And we're saying to Nigerians that, look, 2023, you know, is in their hands. And people just need to understand that it is in their hands. And I think increasingly they are. And, and ultimately, we will make our case to the people and the people will make their judgment and will make their choice. What I can tell you is that these folks who are coming out, who haven't come out in previous elections, they are not coming out to exercise that mandate frivolously. Most of them are thinking carefully about who they want to vote for. Mm. Let's go into your blueprint and what you want to do for Lagos. What do you think is most expedient for you to take on um, if you were to resume office as governor, if you were opportune to be governor of Lagos State? What would yes. be the first things that you would address? Okay. So there are a few things. The first is the reform of the government sector. We think there's a need for a lot of reform there. First of all, we think civil servants need to be better paid. So when we come in, we want to increase the salaries of civil servants as part of a program of getting those salaries to a reasonable level, to give them a reasonable level What would level you consider reasonable here? Because again, well, you it know, has we, to, I mean, I know that Lagos has a great revenue base, but um, how do you intend to do that? Because even the federal government has come up to say that they're going to increase salaries across the board mm -hmm. um, for, the, for the civil servants to, to, to um, somewhat measure or rather stay hand in hand or side by side with the realities of today. But then there are states who would hear this and say, well, we also want our monies to be increased, but they do not have the same capacity as Lagos. That's exactly the point. So in Lagos, we should not be sitting around with civil, you know, civil servants, government workers that are not paid a living wage, right? Because the state has the means and the resources to improve the compensation of its workers. Now, um, you see, Lagos State's budget in this year, 2022, is $1.7 Right? Um, that is the budget of several states combined. Right? Lagos has the means to do a lot more than it is doing. If you look at the proportion of the budget that is represented by personnel cost of government workers, it is very feasible to do what I'm saying, right? Because it's a, it's, it's a relatively small component of the whole piece. You see what I mean? So we'll come in, we will do an increase when we come in, and then we'll have a program over a couple of years of trying to get those salaries commensurate so that people earn a decent wage. Mm. And then we will insist that people serve the people with integrity, are accountable and are transparent in what they do. And then we will set in the rewards and we will also put in the consequences. We will ensure that people operate according to codes of conduct, which, by the way, exist. It's not as if we're going to write any new rules of codes of They are there. We're just insisting that people um, um, commit to them and essentially abide by them. Yeah. Right? Um, so, for example, the fact that you cannot, you should not, if you are sitting in a seat, be using that seat to benefit yourself giving a contract to a company that is close to you or that is yours is in the codes. It's called conflict of interest. Right? We will ensure that people abide by those things. And we will insist. And we, who are at the topmost levels of government, will hold ourselves to the same standards. Hmm. Part of the reason why people... But who checks you? Whoever checks the civil service. And we will have... The, well, they the, work for you. How no, will they check no, you? they are independent entities. They are independent. In, if you're in an organization, you are the CEO. You are not above the law because there are audit departments, there are compliance departments, there are risk departments, there are surveillance departments. Do you understand? So, if you set the right systems in place, a function of who is at the top, 
it's a function of who is at the top. So, so, so that's one, government reform, right? So pay people well, insist that they do that. And by the way, this thing about paying people well, you may be surprised to find that your actual revenue may go up. So it's not a zero-sum game, right? Because part of what happens when you don't pay people well is that they find other ways of supplementing their income. And a lot of the time, those things that they do robs government of revenue. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And takes that money away into private pockets. So it's not a zero-sum game. It may actually not even cost as much as you think it, it, it will. It may, it may actually even increase revenues. So that's government reform. It's foundational. As part of that, by the way, I have to tell you that one of the things that we'll do away with almost immediately is this practice of having people, private organizations, collect government revenue and then keep a piece of it. So in Lagos State, for example, we have an entity that does that, collects tax revenues on behalf of the government and keeps a piece of it. We will remove that because with government has a whole internal revenue service. We will come back because we need to talk about, I'm sure you're talking about uh, Alpha Beta. We'll yes, come I'm back talking and about talk Alpha more Beta. About it. Well, we're still in the studio live with the ADC governorship candidate here in Lagos State, Funsha Doherty. Uh, I hope I got it right this time. We're <laughs> getting closer. <laughs> okay. We'll be right back after this break. Stay with us. It's still plus politics, and we are discussing, of course, 2023 uh, elections and the governorship race in Lagos State. Our guest is the ADC governorship candidate in the state, Funsha Darty. Well, I got it right this time. Now, before we went on that book, we were talking about Alpha Beta. Mm -hmm. What exactly is it that Alpha Beta is doing that does not sit right with Lagos State? Well, I mean, well, it doesn't sit right with, with, with me and uh, with us. We believe that um, the state, a principal activity of the state is the collection of its revenue. It's a principal activity of the state. And we have a whole state internal revenue service that's devoted to that effort. Now, I see no reason why we should have a private sector entity essentially being contracted to do that work and then keeping a share of those revenues, right? Because it's the people's money. It's the people's money. Who owns that entity? Who are the beneficiaries of that entity? Where is that money that is being withheld? In whose pockets is it ending up? It's the people's money, right? So we should unwind it empower the state internal revenue service, pay them well, and let them do their work. And then we put in the rewards and the consequences and, and we hold people to account. If they do a good job, we reward them. If they do a bad job, we, they have consequences. If they steal money, we persecute them. We will run the state as a state should be run. It's not a private sector entity. So we will unwind it. We will unwind it, simple. And if there, are, if, there are, if there are legal processes that we have to go to, well, no, I'm not saying we'll come in and, and, um, and not abide by the law or what have you. We will go through whatever legal processes are required to unwind it. And we'll unwind it for the benefit of Lagosians. Mm. Can I talk a little bit more about, um, because you asked me about our programs. I talked on government reform. Yes, and then yes. you, you held me there. To alphabet. Let's talk about other reforms uh, yeah. that you would bring. So, so, so a few things. Uh, one is infrastructure. And infra under infrastructure, you talk about, um, you talk about transport, you talk about power, you talk Let's about... Let's talk waste. about the roads first. So, so ra roads and, and transport infrastructure in Lagos, as you know, is a very sore point for Lagosians. Lagosians spend hours in traffic. Um, Lagos has one of the highest commute times in the world. Well, uh, there's a report that says that uh, Lagosians spend half of their lives in traffic. It's a lot of time. And you know, it's not just the time and the inconvenience. There are health consequences when you have traffic of the nature that we do. It affects air quality. It affects people's quality of life. If people drop in dead, you may not know why they're dropping dead. But some of, some of this has something to do with it. 
The problem in Lagos, I think, is that there's a few things. One, there's too much focus on the road infrastructure at the expense of rail and water, which could be valid options for transportation. Lagos is blessed because we're a coastal city, so we're on the Atlantic. But it's not just that. We have the lagoon, which also runs mm -hmm. almost lengthwise across the state. So that is also a veritable blessing that we can use to, to move people. How? If you, I mean, if you have were going, boats listen, that go to Corridor and yes, back. Yes, so you have boats that go to Corridor, but you know, those are little boats run by you know, private sector entities. Most people, you know, many people don't feel comfortable going in those boats, right? Mm -hmm. Many people don't. Others do, right? But they are not, what, you, what we need to do is to raise that service to a robust um, mainstream form of transportation. So that if you take certain key routes, for example, if you took Ikorodu to Victoria Island, where a lot of people make that commute daily, right? And you had a robust ferry service with decent vessels that people felt comfortable going on. You would decongest a lot of traffic just by doing that. I lived in a coastal city in a developed uh, economy. And it was very like Lagos, actually. And in my office, People came, some people came by road, some people came by ferry, some people came by rail. And it wasn't a function of how your socioeconomic status. It's a function of what was convenient for you based on where you lived. You see what I mean? So, so, um, so we need to do more in terms of this water infrastructure. But, 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 and, and then on rail, before I come to road, because you know, uh, road is also important, and on rail, we have to interrogate what this government has been doing on rail for 15 years. We have to interrogate it. Why is it taking 15 years to build one axis of travel? Why? Other countries have done theirs, they've moved on. It's the whole thing appears to be shrouded in secrecy. We don't understand what the transparency, what the accountability is associated with it. Why is it taking so long? Let's know. And if we're not doing it right, who is doing it? Why are they not doing it? What consequences have emerged as a result of they're not doing it? And so on and so forth. That's real. But let me also say that a big part of our problem mm -hmm. is that there's, on the roads that we do have, there's too much disorder, chaos, indiscipline on the roads. Yes, we have some roads that are bad, many roads that are bad, and that contributes to the problem. But there's a great deal of indiscipline. But we have traffic controls. We have um, LASMA. We have the police traffic officials also. Um, so, 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 so you, again, you have to ask yourself that what is the actions of these officials? Are they acting fully in the public interest? Are they reasonably compensated? Are they there to make people do the right thing? Or are they there to find people who are not doing the, the, the right thing and then get a gratification for it, which we see a lot of the time. Again, mm. I'm not telling people anything that they don't know, that they don't mm -hmm. experience, right? But, but, and, last and officials, but last month officials signed a contract. They were given a job. They know what that last month means. That's the job that they were given. Now, what they do, as opposed to what they should be doing, is what we're bringing to question here. But I don't think there's a question as to them knowing what their job should be. You see, all, all government workers know what their job should be. Exactly. Whether they do it or not is a function of the incentives you give them, the rewards you put, and the consequences that you bring. And then other things like training and those kinds of things, right? Those are the things that determine whether people do what is expected of them or not. Nigerians, you see, you see it's a function of the, 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 the context you set for people is the way they will behave. So a lot of the time people talk about Nigerians who... You know, they are indisciplined here. But the minute they go to London or, or New York, they are like the most disciplined people, right? They conform, they obey the rules, they do well, right? Because the system reinforces that behavior. Mm -hmm. And so we have to create the right systems from leadership through to systems, through to processes, through to rewards and consequences that will then drive the right behaviors, mm -hmm. right? The other thing about the road infrastructure is that there are some actors on our roads, right? So some of the touts, some of the union workers, road transport union workers, 
who are a menace on the roads. Right? Now, the job of any self-respecting government should be to curb the activities of those entities to the extent that they are detrimental to the interests of its citizens. Right? One of the reasons we have a problem is that we do not see government, the current government, um, taking the role that it ought to do in curbing some of these entities. And also. we would argue mm -hmm. that part of the reason why that is is because government and some of these unions are in bed with one another. And the unions facilitate the process of government coming to power. How exactly do you mean? Can you clearly state So, this? So these unions tend to be... Um, these unions tend to be very active in the political, um, in the political realm, and the leadership of some of these uh, NURTW tends to be very active in the political realm. They tend to be uh, utilized right, by um, some of these main, mainstream uh, pol politicians in um, their political activities, um, in, in uh, uh, driving and... Um, driving uh, voter behavior, right? Uh, intimidation, right? Um, they are used, right? And this, you know, so that, that um, almost like incestuous relationship between the unions, right, and the government in power is such that you can almost think ab about some of these entities as being part of the power structure within the state. You see what I mean? And if they are part of the power structure within the state, then the government is beholden to them. Right? So some of the actions that it should normally take to curb excesses, it would not be in a position or would not be or would be unwilling to take. Hmm. Now, we are saying that that should not be how do you take the Agbero syndrome? So, so we are saying that we are saying that a government that is elected on the backs of the people, right? The five out of six that we talked about, if two of them come out and say, you know what, we're going to select our leaders based on um, and we're going to vote for them in mass, willingly of our own volition, right? Because these are the people that we think should govern us, right? As a government, when you, are, when you come to power on that platform, right, you have only one mandate, and that's the mandate of the people. You see what I mean? So any interest that is inimical to the interest of the people, you are in a position to deal with. How do you deal? It's the how I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Because you know in Lagos, we have the Omoniles, we have the Agbaros, we have... The NURTW, we saw the drama that happened early this year, I think also last year, uh, fighting, the infighting within themselves and who's going to be king and who's not going to be. How do you go about it? Because that's, I guess that's what Lagosians would be more interested in. How do you deal with it? We want to know the how. Well, so, I mean, the, the, what you have to realize is that any behavior that is, um, that is contrary to, that is disorderly conduct, any, dis any a behavior that creates a, a, a health hazard or, or, or safety hazard on the roads, there are, there are already existing laws against some of these things. So it's a function of enforcing the laws that we, we already have, right? Mm -hmm. And government just needs to ensure that we, we enforce those laws and we prosecute those that we find to be fall falling afoul of the laws. By the way, Union activity is fine, right? There's, no, there's nothing wrong with union activity, right? But sometimes what you see is that even the leadership of the unions are sometimes exploitative of the member, their own memberships, right? So even the transport workers on the roads, the commercial workers on the road, the commercial uh, transport workers, you will see that a lot of the time, they also are victims of this process, right? If you talk to them, they will tell you that... Um, there's a process by which they are required, essentially, to uh, make payments, right, daily, 
right, which are not insignificant payments, right? Um, and they, a lot of them, if you talk to them, are groaning under these things, and they view them as, they view them as themselves, and they are, in fact, victims. But the Lagos State government has come up recently to um, say that they had, the, there is no payment of whatsoever because there was a report that made it to the news that um, they were being told to um, ask to pay certain monies in support to raise monies for the candidates of the AD, uh, APC, I beg your pardon, in the mm -hmm. state. And the government of Lagos State has come out to um, say that that's not true. Well, I'm not talking about... They have debunked that. No, I'm not um, talking about raising money for elections. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that they are out there to raise money. That's not what I'm referring mm -hmm. to. I'm saying that everyone who operates a commercial vehicle in Lagos mm -hmm. is daily, daily accosted by and a victim of the, the unions and the leadership and the tiles of the unions. And even people who own commercial buses will tell you that the amount of money that they have to pay, right, each, for each day that their bus is on the road, right, is almost extortionary. Mm -hmm. Right? And this should not be. Okay. Okay. Let's move away from that. Let's talk about youth. Uh, you, you spoke earlier on about the NSAS. It was because mm. young people um, were tired of being brutalized uh, or wrongly profiled by policemen. Mm. So it was started as, let's put an end to bad policing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, let's put an end to bad governance. Mm -hmm. And then we saw what happened October 20, 2020. Um, now, young people are pushing for a youthful leader. They want a young governor. They want a young leader, someone who would understand the plight of young people. Um, can we say that you, your government would be open to empowering young people and creating that environment for um, things to go in their way? I think that um, the answer to that is certainly. Um, you see, if you, if you are paying attention, obviously you know that you know, there are more youths in our population than any other uh, bracket. In fact, our median age in Nigeria is probably somewhere around 17 or 18, right? That tells you that half of the population is actually below that age. Mm -hmm. So you cannot ignore that uh, the youth, right? Because the youth are, they are central, they are our future. Uh, they are actually our energy and the, a, a, a vast and viable resource. But there are many nations that are aging and they're dealing with the, with the opposite problem that we have, right? They are looking for ways, they, you know, they, they can't, they are looking, they're trying to manage their societies because they have too many old people. So we have actually what is an asset, but we cannot, we cannot get the benefit of it or it will not be an asset if we don't treat it like an asset, if we don't treat these youth in a way that allows us to harness and, um, and um, fulfill the full potential of this youth, right? So giving them the right opportunities, ensuring that we give them the right education, which is one of our other plank, plank, uh, planks of our policy. Talking right? about education, there, yeah. uh, there was a research that showed that there are less and less um, people um, enrolling in public schools. There's this a dwindling number yes. of people. Um, and, and, of course, that shows that the level of education is somewhat low or abysmal. Um, what will you do in that regard to you know, so win in, back the love for public schools? Yeah, so in education, there are a few things. Um, people vote away from the public educational system, as you've just said, uh, because they don't have confidence in it. They don't have trust in it. Even people who can't really afford to send their kids to private schools do everything that they can to put the kids in private schools because they don't trust the public schools. The, a similar thing is true, by the way, of the health, the primary health care facilities that we have in the public sector. Um, but we think a few things are needed. One is that the curriculum itself needs to be reviewed. Okay, and this needs to be an ongoing process. But we need to bring the curriculum um, constantly into the modern world to ensure that we are we're raising and training children uh, that are well um, capacitated for the environment in which they find themselves. They will find themselves, okay? Um, secondly, we cannot run away from teacher quality and teacher quality issues. 
and if they are teachers, there are lots of very good teachers in our public schools, but we also know that there are a number of bad eggs. And we also know there are a number of teachers who have no business being around our kids and teaching our kids. Mm -hmm. And we have to do something about that and address teacher quality. Um, we also have to um, increase vocational options within the schools. Because not everybody is suited for a desk job or will find a desk job or is gifted for a desk job or even wants one. There are people who are gifted to work in all sorts of other ways. And we have to expand the range of vocational options that are available that our kids can tap into. Right? Um, and we have to tie this to our other policies, such as our policies around supporting small and medium scale businesses and the ease of doing business. Because those small businesses are the ones that ultimately end up employing two, three, and four people. Okay. In a commercial city like Lagos, that is where the bulk of employment will come from. And the vocational training in the public schools also needs to support that activity. Well, time is not our friend. I would have continued this conversation. But lastly, just in a sentence, I need you to answer me. Recently, there's been some drama coming from the national. Uh, the, the, the national. The national chairman has ousted your national presidential candidate. Uh, the presidential candidate and the National Working Committee are saying that, well, your, your national chairman has been there for 17 years. Um, again, the, there always is a trickling down effect for whatever happens at the national. Where do you stand on this particular issue? Um, our stand, my stand and our stand in Lagos is that these are you know, constitutional issues and they need to be dealt with. Uh, ultimately, um, some of the parties are already in court. Right? and the court will make rulings on, on, on the matter. Uh, so some of this may even be sub -judies. But, um, but it's important to note that political parties um, you know, are like families. In fact, they're like very large families. <laughs> right? And um, there's no large family in which you will not have, from time to time, disagreements. Okay. And so yes, we have a disagreement. And people, they need to, people need to work out, and there may be different views and different um, 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 perspectives around it. But the important thing is that there is a, uh, a process that people are going through to resolve that. It may be contentious, but ultimately, we will get, we'll get to the solution. Well, uh, Funcha Darty is the governorship candidate of the ADC in Lagos State, and he's been speaking to us about his ambition to be governor. Uh, well, we will say thank you again for being here. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for being part of the conversation. Before we leave tonight, we'd like to leave you with some of the highlights of the week, in case you missed it. I am Mary Anakun. We'll see you on Monday, Talking for Development. any kind of false information in the media, I think he's just trying to, to fulfill his all his own personal ego. But technically, there is nothing of that being done at the Labour Party. We are preparing for our campaign organization and at the same time, making sure that we get down to the grassroots to coordinate our affair because the Nigerian people are already showing so much love for us, and we are grateful for the love that they show to us. But I make them refuse to recognize a candidate um, who, whose primary they did not witness, except the court otherwise direct. So what you see going on is not a loophole in the law. It's politicians trying to flex the law, subject it to different judicial interpretation until it gets to the Supreme Court, we are there will be a final uh, judicial pronouncement. That is what is going on for it. We have less persons who are in the gray area. You saw what happened during the um, registration process. You saw a turn up of a lot of persons. And these were first time persons who were registering. These were not people who were going to um, change their PVCs. These were not persons who were going there to um, complain. No, these were first time persons who were coming to register for the first time. So a lot of persons are interested. A lot of persons want to ensure that they vote. Let me tell you the truth. I've not voted. This ever. election? Ever. 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 Rule that we mentioned. Where are the roads in Lagos? These are just reality. Go to the interland, go around Lagos. What you just need is few hours of rain, and you will hardly be able to move around Lagos.
Recently, a video is going viral regarding the experience of people around Ibejuleki local government, precisely Aoyaya area. They said consistently over the years they have been having this challenge that whenever there is a little rain, there will be total gridlock within that axis. And it's not limited to them. Come around now, just as we speak now, move around Lagos and you see. And you see the challenge, you see the, the terrible state of infrastructure in Lagos State. Now, Jando is bringing a human faith to governance. He is a Lagosian and he knows the state um, like the back of his, of his hands. And so we are going to correct right from the scratch the deficiency that we have observed in the area of governance is a major concern to Jando. And num no, number one, principally, is that even the governor of the state will not take decision on his own. He needs a second level of approval. That is the first thing to correct. No matter how good a governor could be, as long as he's from APC, he will be unable to perform because there is a power behind the scene. And every obnoxious law that does not care whether people perish, as long as you want to govern, will be revealed. That is clear. It is clear. Negotiations need government with human face. And those governments will not hesitate to take hard decisions to make sure that the state run properly. But it will also accommodate the people because it is in government for the people. It is the government of the people. And so as much as we ensure order and the legal egalitarianism, we will also ensure there is empathy. Empathy. And that is what some this government lacks. That is what this government lacks. You will just shut down a market just because some few individuals violate government regulations. Not minding that there are thousands of people whose livelihood is attached to what they make daily from the market. That is, that is wicked. That is insensitive. And look, go and check the number of people who are found culpable of these offenses belongs to the downtrodden members of the public 